This morning's message comes from the book of Romans, chapter 11, verse 33 through 36. If you're using a pew Bible, that's going to be on page 1122. Romans 11, 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has ever given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. This is God's word. Thank you. Well done, ministry, music, and... uh all varieties of the ministry of music today so well done we thank you in the name of jesus the passage today is is a <clears throat> this is a song to god from paul and you'll notice the verses verse 33 to 36 verse 33 comes on the heels of 32 and basically 9 through 11 and this passage is a passage of delight. Paul <clears throat> is essentially answering the question, why does God deserve glory? He is answering this question uh, for, by the Holy Spirit for our benefit today. Why does God deserve glory? Glory being high praise from his people. And then he goes on to provide, if you like, two answers that can stimulate us to give God greater glory. So implicit in here uh, is, this, is this question, why does God deserve glory or high praise? And a couple of answers are given, we will look at those in a moment. The passage, verse 33, obviously, is supported by verse 34 and 35 with the, verse, the word for, or the reason is, and then verse 36, for the reason is, this text is a brilliant unity, and there are essentially two, two reasons that fall out of it. Uh, we could shake out more, but in the interest of time, we will just do two, 33 through 36. One of the, <clears throat> one of the doctrines that appears here is called the doctrine of the incomprehensibility of God, which simply means that believers can grasp some of the things about God, but we can never hold God in our grasp. That is to say, we can never know him totally, even by the ministry of the Holy Spirit working through the word of God. We know sufficiently about God. So you'll see that fallout as we go along, and I'll reference a couple of verses. Here then, is this word that comes from God. It's called a doxology. It is also called a hymn of praise. This is a hymn of praise in various ways that must be upon the church's heart. Uh, this, this is um, a vital, vital position that we must maintain in the church. If we lose sight of the glory of glorying God, then we lose sight of the faith entirely. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, through your word, O oh Lord, help us to stand in awe of you and to glorify your name. We have seen in this book of Romans much truth and now, Lord, as we proceed, let us pause for a moment and lift up our praise to you. We do ask, Lord, that you would bring your church in America to its knees so that we might repent of delighting in ourselves and in our buildings, in our cash, in our things and glory in you alone 
We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Uh, I was reading this week that a total solar eclipse of the sun, total solar eclipse of the sun will take place on 21 August 2017. So we have time to prepare. 21 August 2017. And the total eclipse occurs when the apparent diameter of the moon covers the sun in the sky so that you go from daylight and then progressively to twilight and then poof, to darkness. Now this, um, <clears throat> this total eclipse, according to what I read, will take, will, will be, those who can see it, will take two minutes and 40 seconds. Two minutes and 40 seconds. What happens if it's two minutes and 39? Things are, are off. It'll be two minutes and 40 seconds for those who can see the total eclipse. And that won't be very many people. It'll be a thin strip down in certain portions of America. And you can find it on the internet. There's this little strip. And those will be able to see the total eclipse. Other people who will be viewing in other areas of this land and other parts of the world will not see the, um, <clears throat> a total eclipse. They'll see a partial eclipse. But the total folks will see that apparent diameter of the sun or of the moon block out the sun and it boom, darkness comes. How many have seen a total eclipse, by the way, who are here today? A total eclipse of the sun. Yes, yes, I have, I have, I have, I saw it in the early 1970s, even before it was made famous by Carly Simon. A total eclipse took place in Nova Scotia. Yes, it did. And I did not see it with my these little pearly things here uh, we had to watch through devices you know to keep our eyes from being harmed or in through reflection uh, some were, were able to see it <clears throat> as it was unfolding on uh, by way of special uh, telescope and camera mountings but anyway it was quite impressive to see your, your brilliant sunshine one moment then suddenly the diameter of the moon begins to move across the sun and at that moment when you see a little sliver of the sun in the next, a corona, and then poof, and for a minute or so, I can't remember exactly, we're in darkness. And um, <clears throat> it was amazing. Afterwards, many of my students and people in the newspapers, of course, were reporting on this wonderful uh, thing that took place, we were able to see a total eclipse of the sun, and even from Halifax, Nova Scotia, where nobody cares. Anyway, we, we saw this, this, this beautiful display of God's glory, how his, his world operates. I wasn't a Christian then, but I was just struck, and many people were amazed. It was a wonder to behold, people said. Well, now think about this. The Apostle Paul, just an ordinary guy, he's converted by God, and he's called by God to write the book of Romans. So he's writing Romans. And then God shows him something through the Holy Spirit, something so amazing that it sets him back on his heels. And it, it's this whole thing of salvation history. God shows him by the Holy Spirit, and he wrote it down for us, what happened and is happening and is going to happen in salvation history. He saw this. He saw the time of, 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 of ethnic Israel. God called the Jews out from among the nations. What mercy, what mercy was this? And at that time, this mercy was displayed against the backdrop of uh, the disobedience of the Gentiles or the Goy or the nations. So all of this is going on and, and Paul was shown it. Yeah, yeah, thank you, God. Thank you, God. And then he showed him more. He said, and by the way, then the ethnic Israelites rejected the gospel and have entered into an era of consigned disobedience, just as the Gentiles once had. But now the Gentiles are pouring into the church. This is the age of the Gentile. And, and oh, the many are coming in. And uh, <clears throat> isn't this delightful? And Paul could see it. So the, the mercy shown to the Gentiles against the backdrop of the disobedience of ethnic Israel. But, he's, but God is not done with ethnic Israel because just before the second coming of Christ, you'll have this great ingathering of the Jews. And, and uh, to the glory of God, his mercy will be displayed again. And this time against the backdrop 
of the mercy shown to the Gentiles. So you have mercy upon mercy, grace upon grace shown to the people of the earth, the Jews and the Gentiles. And when Paul saw this, he didn't say, oh, well, I don't know of anybody, by the way, in Nova Scotia who had, I, there may have been, but when the, the, um, you know, the eclipse was going on, who just said, oh, another minute of sleep. No, it was, it was amazing. People just went back on their, on their heels. Wow. <laughs> I've never seen it since. But what a delightful thing to observe. And Paul, infinitely greater in, um, incident, was able to see by the Holy Spirit the salvation history open up before him and there God shows his work. And what does Paul do? He steps back in amazement and he says this. This is what he says. And what Paul is doing here, he, he sees all this wonder with the power of the Holy Spirit. He begins to glorify God. He gives glory to God, which is our purpose anyway as Christians. We're to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And Paul touches on this a little further on. Just let me go there. Ephesians chapter 1. If Paul just doesn't <clears throat> stop here in Romans. You see it in his letters. He's a man who gives glory to God. Listen to this. Romans chapter 1, uh, verses 11 and 12. In him, that is God, we have attained an inheritance, comes from God, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. See, there's that salvation history again, the counsel of his will, so that, this is the result, uh, we who were the first hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. This expresses who we are. This is so that we who the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. That's the whole purpose of our lives is to bring glory to God. So let's go back to Romans. Now, <clears throat> this is Paul. He's showing us our role as believers is primarily to glorify God for what he has done. Now, this purpose is hindered in many ways in the West by a self-centered attitude which is characterized by demands such as make me happy, give me what I want, uh, I deserve a better life, so be at it God, and so on. Today we're going to discover a question and a couple of answers that I hope, uh, with respect to sinners like me, that I will be able to grasp this truth by the Holy Spirit and to give God glory that He so deserves. This mouth, this heart, this mouth, this mind must, must praise God and give Him all the glory. So we're going to talk about, we're going to give an answer to this question. Why does God deserve glory anyway? As soon as Paul says in this verse, verse 36, B, to him be glory forever. Amen. He puts a period on this section from Romans 9 through 11. And what he's saying is God deserves glory. And now <clears throat> prior to this, from verses 36 through, or 33 through 36a, we see the reasons for this giving of glory. And they're the very reasons that we must attend to as we live our Christian lives. I have no doubt that uh, <clears throat> in the United States right now, the visible church, you have very little glory being given to God. You have fake revivals going on across the land even now. Just fake and nonsense, nonsensical, pointing to man, but not to God. We're going to discover the answers to this question. Why does God deserve glory anyway? And let's ask God, oh God, revive our hearts. May these two answers to this question 
ignite a flame within our souls that cannot be put out. So God deserves to receive glory from our hearts, from our lips, from our minds for at least two reasons. And we're going to do that right now. Let's look at the text. Verse 33. Let me just read verse 32 to give you the flavor. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. This is a different kind of eclipse that he's watching. You have, you have the disobedience and then the brilliance of God's mercy coming across. So we see the disobedience of humanity, that, that, that uh, consignment and the shadowy disobedience of humanity. And all of a sudden, the delight of the Son of Man coming and the mercy of God displayed and it, it brings to our souls great light. And this is what struck Paul. Verse 33. Oh, the depth. Now think of this. The depth. The word should, should bring to mind the oceans and what appear to be bottomless, bottomless trenches. This deep, very deep, very uh, much beyond Com mere comprehension so the depth of the riches and you should think when you think of riches it's it's think of immeasurable of the riches abounding of God his his throne think of his throne and of his majesty and the train as it was described by the prophets this glorious picture of God his riches the delights of God, innumerable. And the better translation, this text reads, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God should really be translated, probably a better translation. The depth of the riches, uh, the depth of the riches of both wisdom and knowledge of God. So it's, uh, Oh, the depth of the riches of both the wisdom and the knowledge of God. You can translate it the way it is in my Bible. You can also translate it the other way. So the, the deep and immeasurable qualities of God. How unsearchable are His judgments. How inscrutable His ways. The word inscrutable can also be translated incomprehensible. We'll touch on that in a moment. Therefore, the first answer to the question, why does God deserve glory? All the glory from the people of God that we can muster by the power of the Holy Spirit through our sinful lives. We should glorify God. Why does he deserve it? One, because of his infinite qualities. Infinite qualities. Think of light traveling across the universe and it's going from from the earth on into space and it just keeps going and going and going and going and going and going and our mind can attach onto that that's not a that's really not a good way to understand infinite but at least we can attach to it and get a glimmer so here it is his infinite qualities paul extols the infinite wisdom and knowledge of God. Now, just like two discs coming over each other, wisdom and knowledge intersect. And Paul uses words in this, particularly here in verse 36 or 33, that, that intersect. And if you remember geometry, you have a sphere and another sphere and they intersect. And these intersect in a very delightful way because the words wisdom and knowledge actually add up to one big meaning. God foresees and ordains all that will come to pass in salvation history. He sees it all, past, present, and future, all at once. That's what's happening. His wisdom in salvation history is knowledge. He foresees and ordains. He manages the whole thing and at once. Isn't that amazing? That's God. That should set us back 
on our heels. Look at the words, and how unsearchable are his judgment, how inscrutable his ways. Let's just take the words, and these all intersect, by the way. Judgment and ways intersect, and they also intersect with these words, unsearchable and inscrutable. So you see, Paul is using the language, the Greek language, and it's, it has a mathematical bias here because these words intersect, they interlock, they touch each other because he can't, by the Holy Spirit, he's drawing a verbal picture here that should strike our hearts. You can't just use a single word here. You have to use many words and they have to intersect in order to describe God. So his infinite qualities then, he says, oh, the depth and the riches of both the wisdom and knowledge of God. Wisdom and knowledge, what does that mean that God foresees and ordains all that will come in salvation history? Oh, okay, take a little breath. He goes on, how unsearchable, inscrutable. Let's just take those two words. They overlap too. Now this is interesting because it means how incomprehensible to us. How we have, when we look at the things of God and the Word of God by the Holy Spirit, as Paul did, and in this particular passage, writing Scripture by the, the inspiration of God, he's just struck. I can't get all of this. The words, unsearchable, inscrutable, some of your translations may say untraceable. You just can't draw it. You just put the pen down. Ever see something in nature, something that, mm, you know, there's something that appears. If you're an artist, I'm not. I draw stick people. Some of you can draw really well. And you know that when you look at something, <clears throat> you say, I'm going to draw that. And start, you, you do it. But then there might come that time when you see something that is so intricate, you just put the pen down and look at it. <sighs> Amazing. That's what Paul is saying. Unsearchable, untraceable inaccessible to mere humans ha ah, but not in totality total knowledge is inaccessible that's what this means we can acquire partial by revelation but we can't get the full picture that's what the words are driving at it's not totally we cannot remember what incomprehensibility is we can grasp some things and that satisfies and we must keep going and going and understanding more and more and more but we cannot have God in our grasp we can grasp some things about God but we cannot grasp him totally that's what incomprehensibility means that's what what unsearchable and inscrutable intersect and mean so unsearchable untraceable we can't know God Totally, but we can know things partially by revelation of the Holy Spirit and that satisfies and keeps us close to God. Now notice the words judgments and ways. Judgments and ways. These are other intersecting uh, spheres, if you like, of meaning. Now, what does that mean? What's this all about? What do you mean judgments and ways? Well, they add up to the activity of God in salvation history they include his decisions moment by moment by moment by moment and paul is looking at this thing by the holy spirit and he sees god is in he is in charge he is over all wow he is the governor of salvation history we don't want to hear that in the west we want to hear hey i'm the big cheese i'm the big gouda who is this God? Now, if we take all of this, we take the words, the riches, depth and riches of what? Of both. Wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable, untraceable, incomprehensible. Grasp some things, but you never can grasp all of God. His judgments and his ways are this, are described as such. His, his decisions, his, his management, if you like, of salvation history, moment by moment, even those things over in that corner over there, over here, God 
is. So how do we put this all together? His infinite qualities, that is. Human beings see the bare events as they transpire through salvation history. We can't. We have to look through a device to see what's going on and to understand truth. We look through the device of prayer. We look through the device of the Word, motivated and guided by the Holy Spirit. We couldn't see it otherwise. We're just blinded by its brilliance. But when, when you take, when you look at the glorious God, we can give Him glory. We look through the device of word and prayer, and we reject self, look at word and prayer, we see wisdom, knowledge, judgments, ways, unsearchable, untraceable judgments and ways. And it sets us back on our heels. Turn to Deuteronomy 29, 29. Here is a verse, Deuteronomy 29, 29, that can help us understand the term infinite qualities. <clears throat> Deuteronomy. Now, some of you know it by heart. It's a familiar verse. Deuteronomy 29, <clears throat> 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us. This is called the doctrine of the incomprehensibility of God. And our children forever, that we may do all the words of of his law, that we may do all the words of his law. Paul was not able to see the totality of God, but he is in that region where he can see partial. And that's an understanding that comes from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 29, 29, and 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Notice this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse <clears throat> 9 and 10. And the Bible says this. I'll go back to verse 8. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would, have, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written... What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. The delights, the wonders of God, the Spirit searches. What's the point? That is what Paul saw was this wonderful picture of God. And then he was brought to glorify God. And he glorified God because God has these infinite qualities of wisdom and knowledge and judgment. And he judges in particular ways and he judges in unsearchable and untraceable ways. Infinite qualities. Paul can't see it all, but he can see some. And it's enough to, to give him... It sets him back on his heels, it gives him joy, and it brings him to glorify God. He has infinite qualities of wisdom and knowledge. He has these qualities that are unsearchable, untraceable, these judgments and ways. He can see some things, but not totally, because he's not allowed to. He can only see what is given to him. And even then, he cannot look upon it with mere human eyes. He looks upon it through the lens of word and prayer, through the revelation of God, and by the aid of the Holy Spirit. So now what should, do we say? Paul gives glory to God because of his infinite qualities observed in salvation history and that only is partial do we not see as in a glass dimly here's a question to take from this quality we're going to apply this in a moment more application but just the beginning 
Why are we so slow to give God glory when his infinite qualities are displayed in the Bible? Why, are pe why am I so slow to give him glory? To say to him, God, you have demonstrated in your word that I have just read this quality. You have demonstrated this wonderful attribute and for that I give you glory. Why am I so slow to do this? May the Holy Spirit show me why. And then there's another quality. The question is, why does God deserve our glory? His infinite qualities. That's why he possesses infinite qualities. But he also has absolute position. Absolute position. Infinite qualities. Absolute position. All right, what are we talking about? Look at verses 34 through 36. Now, here we get the four words, four words, four F-O-R, F-O-R. And I'm going to squeeze these together, 34 to 36A. And we'll come up with the second reason why God deserves. It's because of his absolute position that he deserves glory. Now, here are quotes from, <clears throat> these are quotes from Isaiah chapter 40 and from Job. We have various quotes uh, from Job compressed here. Paul writes, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? <laughs> What's he saying? These are questions that demand an answer. No one! <clears throat> no one is. Who has given counsel to God? Nobody. They can't. Who's known his mind? These feeble minds of humanity, we think we know him? No way. Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? In other words, who has given him counsel? And God has said, oh, that's so good. I'm going to give you this gold or something. Yeah, nonsense. That doesn't happen. This is God. The mere human mind doesn't. God doesn't wait around wringing his hands. Oh, goodness. I wonder if someone can help me out with this big problem. I, I, I just don't know how to reach the nations. I can't do it. Somebody help me. How about marketing, oh God? How about marketing? How about doing a survey and find out it, what people like and then give it to them and that's going to solve the problem, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Never thought of it. Here. How about, you know, you've got cults now in America. How about if we write scripture, more scripture? That's going to help things. Oh, gee, never thought of that. Good idea. Great. Nonsense. Who has given him counsel? <laughs> the God of heaven laughs at such folly. No finite being has enough wisdom to enter into God's mind and tell him how to run the world. No human could have devised the plan that God performed and showed to Paul. They were pretty smart people back then. They built the temple. You have these Romans running around building coliseums. Don't you think they could have figured out, hey, here's how we gather a crowd. Yeah, you know, let's, while we're at it, let's just dumb down the gospel so we get a bunch of people in, in Yahoo State. Yahoo, Yahoo, so that's Yahoo State. Remember that. No human being could have devised the plan that God developed concerning the Jews and the Gentiles. God did it, and he brought it forth. No one has given counsel to God so that one can expect some kind of reward. He is infinitely above our puny minds. Now, Paul is setting us up. This is, this is where God stands. And there is no one who can get into his space. Now, look at this verse. Four. Now, Paul now nails down the position of God. And now, let, let us ask in our minds right now let's ask of ourselves where do we mighty humanity where do we stand 
with this God. For from him and through him and to him are all things. <laughs> Where do we stand? The puny of the punies. Where do we stand with this God? God is declared as the source of all things from him. He is declared as the means by which all things are accomplished through him. And, and he's the goal of all things and to him are all things. That's God. That's his unique position. No one else shares it. No one. He has absolute position, infinite qualities, wisdom, knowledge. And once more, his judgments and his ways are unsearchable and untraceable, infinite qualities. We can know some things, we can grasp some things, but we can never totally grasp God. And that means we grow in him as we live, but we'll never attain full knowledge of God. We attain orthodoxy, but we cannot obtain total knowledge. We couldn't handle it. We can't look at it. And we can only get what we get through the lenses and, and mechanisms of word and prayer through word and spirit. We don't get it any other way. People declaring in their foolish writings, oh, I had a meeting with God and he told me blah, blah, blah. I'm number one on the hit parade. What Balonus Maximus. That has nothing to do with the word of God. It certainly isn't revival. Note that Paul glorified God because of his absolute position. Man does not share God's space. You know, today it's really, there's this phrase, you're in my space. You know, you're too close, you're in my space. It's beyond, you're too close, you're beyond my comfort zone. Did you ever hear that? I haven't. Who has? But anyway, you know, this I've heard it said, Babel, just get in my space. Well, now, God doesn't want us in his space. That is to say, from this reference, he sent his son Jesus to embrace us, to die and to rise for his people, sure. But he welcomes us through Jesus. But he does not want us to assume a position of power over anything that is to say over salvation history over our lives ponder this question in what ways are we living as though we are the means through which things are accomplished in what ways are we living as though we are the means through which things are accomplished God I can I must do this in order to attain this. I know your Bible says, says such and such, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this. I will bring about something far better than your word could ever do in me. So I'm not going to obey that portion of scripture. I'm going to do my own thing. I am going to do my thing and still praise you. <laughs> what nonsense. In what ways are we living as though we're the means through which things are accomplished? I will call upon God when I need him. I will obey him when it fits. Otherwise, I will rationalize away his word and do what I want to do. And still call myself a servant of God. What baloney. God is in the absolute position. We don't share his space in terms of the absolute. But yet me, many of us in the West, we think that we can pick and choose what to obey and thereby say, God, in this case, I am the means through which things are accomplished. And you know what, God? It's all to your glory. That is such nonsense. Why does God deserve glory? He deserves your glory because of his infinite qualities and his infinite position, his absolute position. How shall we apply this beyond the two questions that we have laid out? Very quickly, just a few, four bullet points, and then we'll pray and close the service. This truth can help us, and here are some applications. 
ponder this week God's infinite, infinite qualities. And join with me and ponder his absolute position. Ponder them. And ask God for a heart like Paul's that can see these things in the Word of God. This is not the only passage. Old Testament, New Testament passages all over the place. We see this. For a heart that can give glory to God for who He is. May God give us a heart that cannot encounter the wonder of God and then turn away from it as if nothing happened. Let us approach the Word of God as if every day and in every way as we approach it, we see the mighty movement of God's hand. And, and you see His mercy. You see His judgments. You see His justice and His righteousness. And they intersect. And they produce for us a wonderful display of truth that sets us back on our heels and says, Wow! That's God. So let's pray. God, as we read Your Word, I don't care if we discover little cutesy insights, what we need in this country, in our church, weak people like me, what we need is to actually encounter the living God as we read and pray and to give him glory for who he is. Secondly, may we never be satisfied with what we know about God. Persevere in study, in prayer, even to the day that we cannot. Because in those days when we are so hindered, perhaps by physical issues, that we can still in our minds delight in the God of the universe, who creates and saves, who is a God of mercy, a God of righteousness, he is a God of love, he is a God of judgment, he is a God of peace. Let us persevere in studying this God. I hear across this land people talking about new revelation. We already have it. It is called the Word of God. And by the Holy Spirit who reveals, we can grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. But not through charlatans. We grow by Christ. Therefore, Lord, set me afire for this. Thirdly, remember this truth. Worship must be planned around God, and I so enjoy what you teams do. You're not entertaining anybody. You may not be called upon by a, 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 an orchestra to be a part. You may not ever be on any other platform than the one here. But let me tell you something. I am so blessed by what you do. Why? Because you give glory to God. Glory to God. And we lisp, God lisps to us his wonders through the word of God in prayer. And we respond and give him glory. One great scholar said that God has to lisp. He has to speak to us in, in child language. I mean, you don't see a baby on the street. You don't pick the child, kid up and say, E equals MC squared. <laughs> No, you pick the child up and you say, something like that. You know, good stuff. Or, on the cheeks. This is a good one. That's a fun one. Kids look at you, huh? Oh, what's wrong with you? But he lisps to us. And that lisping is sufficient because then, by the Holy Spirit, we see it in awe. Oh, look at this. Infinite qualities, absolute position. And we bow before him and give him glory. That's what Paul was doing. Remember this, worship must be planned around giving glory to God and not to meet the needs of a consumer culture whose needs change moment by moment anyway. Worship is about God, and this is absolutely true, not evangelism. I read this article by a modern pagan who calls himself an evangelist, and he said, we have all the time in the world to worship God. Now it's about evangelism. Let's get everything revved up. You're not winning. If you're winning anybody, it's by the mercy of God. Your techniques win nobody. When I read that, I wrote down heresy beside it. Why? This guy doesn't get God. He will be worshipped now and in eternity.
Yes, he will. Worship is about God, not evangelism, not meeting needs. Worship is the fuel that fires evangelism. But it must not be tampered with. God deserves our orthodox glory. He deserves our doxology. He is the ultimate matter, not us. It sounds so noble, doesn't it? Boy, you can build some great big religious corporations on that. Evangelism. What happened to the glory of God? We want to build souls. Fourthly, without Christ, there is no giving of glory to God and no heaven. Therefore, by the Holy Spirit, I declare, beloved, flee. If there is anyone who has no Jesus, flee to Christ. Repent, turn away from sin, that is, and trust or put your faith in Christ, who died on the cross, truly did, and rose up from the dead in the middle of salvation history, if you like, right there where he belongs, the cross. Trust him who died and rose. He and he alone saves. Then you will join with others and delight in observing the wonders of God in his world and in his word. You will see this and then you will step back on your heels and you say, God, you are glorious. You have infinite qualities, wisdom and knowledge. Your ways and your judgments, unsearchable, inscrutable, incomprehensible. And then you will say, oh God, you are absolute in your rule, in your position. Glory to you, glory to you, oh God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you would have us to answer this question and answer it well. <clears throat> Why? <clears throat> you deserve glory, O oh God. And impress upon us the answers. You, O oh God, have infinite qualities and absolute position. Would you humble us, O oh Lord? Remove from us the arrogance of self-centeredness, acclaim, and let us trust wholly in you. We are the means of obtaining nothing. We need you, and we need your Holy Spirit now. Oh God, would you help us to glorify you and to bring you honor, especially in the days ahead.